I started off, grew up in uh, San Francisco, uh, sailing dinghies and lasers, FJs, El Toros, J24s, stuff like that. Um, then I went to the Naval Academy and I learned uh, team racing like a science from my coach, uh, Gary Bodie. Gary Bodie went on to uh, be the U.S. sailing Olympic coach uh, for, I think, at least eight years. Um, anyways, what he did is he had um, basically a textbook, if you will, for the tactics and strategy of team racing. And um, I took notes throughout the four years, and then at one point in my neighborhood, I got mono and they put me on house arrest and I was twiddling my thumbs so I wrote down all my notes and created this little pamphlet on the tactics and, and strategy of team racing and um, it's basically my coach's uh, training and then I tried to put it into print and we have some illustrations so that's kind of where I come from Whoa. I um, kept involved with um, team racing I, I started doing more of it in dinghies um, I obviously I wrote the book and then I sail a snipe. Uh, I've been sailing that for the last 20 years. I still sail lasers. I do frostbiting and, and the, the uh, beer can Tuesday nights up in Annapolis. Um, lived in Virginia Beach, San Diego, Annapolis, San Francisco, just outside of New York City. I think that's it. I married a gal from Erie, Pennsylvania where Joey got uh, one of his US sailing training courses. Um, and um, I was the U.S. Sailing Team Racing Championship chair for four years as well, and that's for the Hinman Trophy. So I've been involved in a lot of team racing. I've seen it at the highest levels. I've done, done a little bit of it. Um, I've also uh, been fairly active recently in getting involved in keelboat team racing, which is perhaps, uh, you saw some pictures earlier of Vanguard 15s doing it and young people doing it. If you're a little less agile, at least in the Vanguard 15, you know, maybe a keelboat might be a way to go or something. But um, I've got a passion for team racing, and I hope to kind of pass that along to you as well as some, some tactics and strategy. So that's my long-winded kind of bio on myself. Um, what I'd like to do is just, uh, uh, I guess, pick out some people here and ask, you know, what is your team racing experience? Uh, whether you have did it, you know, in junior sailing, you've never done it, you did it at college, or, or what you did. Uh, and then the second half of the question is, you know, what do you hope to get out of tonight? So um, representing the uh, Sea Scouts, uh, where's Big Mark? Mark Sr., is he in the room? He left, so Mark Jr., you're going to have to take over. What, what do you, what, what's the team racing experience of the Sea Scouts? Um, okay, cool. Locally, right? Yeah, locally. Okay. <clears throat> and do you guys do a full-on regatta, or you just do some, uh, like, Wednesday night stuff? Okay, cool. And there's no right or wrong answer here. I'm just trying to gauge where everybody's at. Um, by the way, I am an Eagle Scout. I was never a Sea Scout, but uh, I uh, applaud you for endeavoring down the, the road there. Okay, um, next, let's see. How about a gray shirt there? What's your name for, to start off with? Okay, what kind of boat? Okay, so you're going to be a team racer. Good. Well, you're at the right place. We'll talk some more about it. Okay. Uh, the gentleman right there in the uh, blue shirt. I watched it. It's awesome. We went down last year to the Gitwater. We got the Gibson D. And my wife and myself, we raced in the regular open regatta. And then it stayed for a day and we helped the Gibson and we watched the kids play. It was awesome. Yeah. What do you hope to get out of tonight? Okay, but I mean, you hope to get some education tonight? Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, um, let's see. Molly? Uh, I went, I mean, probably a year and a half into general sailing knowledge. I went to the Gita Clinic a year ago, um, or I guess last October, and that was really my first exposure, and then I did our regatta at Kill Riley. Okay. But, um, as far as the goal, just, you know, the more you talk about sailing, the more concepts you get. Yeah. yeah. What, what you'll see in this, and uh, I'm going to leave a couple here with Joey, and he can make copies, or I've got this stuff, as well as the animations. I'm going to show you a few animations. I've got it all on sailingeducation.com, so you can find it there. But um, I'm a true believer of learning, applying on the water, and then coming back and talking about it, that, that kind of process. 
Um, what I see going wrong with whether it's fleet race or <coughs> any kind of team racing is we, we're just going to go out and have fun and race, which is fine. But if your goal is to raise the bar on everybody's level of education and training, there probably needs to be a commitment to the process. And um, when you think about the race course and a team race course, I mean, a team race course, inherently, boats are going to come together all the time. And uh, are you going to remember what happened right at the start or, you know, two-thirds up the beat? And then you throw in, like, let's say there was three races, and you come in, you're like, was that race one or was that race three? So um, when I went to the Naval Academy, we, we wrote the race course down into the component legs. And we would run repetitive drills on those legs. And we talk about that in... Again, back of the manual here on, on running drills. And so what happens is uh, you get used to, okay, when I'm in the scenario, this is what I'm going to do, and this is what I expect to happen from the other side. Because team racing is really like a chess game. Match racing, one-on-one, -on -one, it's very, very predictable. Team racing, there's three matches going on, okay, and then you're trying to figure out, okay, are we in the winning combination or losing combination? So anyways, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but... Um, a few others on, on what you hope to get out of this evening. I forgot your name already. I'm uh, sorry. I'm, um, uh, okay. Well, I hope to get more education. Too. Okay. I'm just learning team racing. And have you done team race before? Oh, it's been in the clinic uh, that we had last fall. Okay. Cool. Well, thanks for being here. How about you? Same thing. Race at the Didn't okay. do any team racing. Not in college? Where'd you go to school? University of Kansas. Okay. Hey. It's, um, it, it is growing. I mean, I think the, some of the universities in the Midwest are, are starting to get um, coaches and, and a lot more active with team racing. So um, it's, it's, it's migrating across the whole country. Um, anybody else want to contribute what they want to get out of tonight, just because I didn't call on everybody? Yes, sir. We're pitching at nearly a vacuum, so I expect something will stick. Okay, good, good. All right, cool. All right, so let, what I'd like to do is first talk about... Um, what we're talking about tonight is, uh, is literally, it's three on three, um, sorry, it's three on three, okay. Um, everybody knows what fleet racing is? Starting line, 15, 20 boats, first across the line gets first, 15th get 15th, okay. Match racing, anybody not know what the America's Cup is? One on one, okay. One guy wins, the other guy doesn't, okay. Team racing. What it is, is it's three on three. So whatever course we choose to race, instead of just one boat, it's three individual boats, OK, against three individual boats. Whether they could be a Sunfish, they could be a Vanguard 15, they could be a Sonar, <clears throat> they could be America's Cup uh, catamarans, maybe. I doubt that, but that would be very expensive. Um, so anyways, that, that's, that's the game, is three on three, OK? Now. Um, the courses that you'll see out there, back in the day when I wrote the book, in the early to mid-90s, we were using the Port Triangle, okay? So that's a fairly um, simple course. You have the opportunities to do uh, passbacks around the course, and then you start, everybody starts together just like a normal fleet race, and you got to try to get into a winning combination by the time that you cross the finish line, okay? Um, a few years back, uh, we said, you know what, we have multiple teams, and I think they did this in Florida when you're down there. They probably ran this N course, okay? This is the N course. It kind of looks like an N, basically. And so you have a start line, and then you go around these two marks to starboard. You go downwind, around these two marks to port, and finish up wind. The benefit of this guy is you can have multiple matches going on at the same time. You could potentially have three races going on the same course. Um, and uh, they're not conflicting with each other. So that's, that's nice. Also, the starboard roundings, are, they add a little more excitement to the, uh, the, the team race. There's some different tactics you've got to apply there. And then uh, this is called the downwind, uh, I call it the equalizer leg, because basically if you're in front and the breeze comes from behind, the guys from behind have a chance to catch up a little bit. So you've got to be especially strong on keeping that solid combination. And then... I put this one down here, um, it may be f confusing, but we have basically, if you don't have any um, safety boats or a, a, a race committee, you could just drop four marks, okay? You have these two marks are your starting line, you say, okay, everybody, start your watches, three minutes, ready? Three, two, one, three minutes, okay? 
and then you uh, dogfight for uh, those three minutes, and then you start, and then you go around this mark, around that mark to starboard, around this leeward mark to port, and then finish again with no finish uh, boat, but you just record your own finishes. So it's a way of if you have, uh, let's say you, you only have four vanguards tonight and you have uh, no, nobody to run the mark set boat, you could do it. You could do two on two and you could do this course. So you can have fun with less than three on three. And uh, if you don't have a volunteer to run the race committee boat. Any questions on the courses? Okay. Now, um, I want to talk about strategy and tactics, okay? When I think of strategy and team racing, the goal is to cross the finish line with the majority of your boats ahead of the other team, okay? So three on three, if you do the matrix of winning combinations and losing combinations, essentially there's 10 winning combinations and 10 losers. If you want to do the math, it's basically if you have 10 points or less when you cross the finish line, you're winning, okay? You won, okay? So obviously all three of these guys have 10 points or less. This has 10, this has 9, that has, well this X means it could be anything, okay? So um, back in the day, okay, when I first started, you know, we wrote a little duct tape on the uh, side of the hull, you know, what the winning combinations were. Some guys would be out there doing the math in their head. That's not really a good plan because these things happen so quick. You've got to know what you need to do. So it's a chess game where you're not allowed a lot of time to <laughs> think about your next move. So instead of being out there with your calculator, figuring out if you're winning or losing, or um, looking at the winning combinations and the losing combinations and figuring out which one you have, instead what I recommend is you say, okay, uh, as we go around this race course, our strategy, our goal, is going to get into one of these three combinations, okay? One, one, two, X. So it could be first, second, third, obviously. It could be first, second, and sixth, okay? If you're in that, it's a solid, strong combination, okay? Or if um, you can get, you get to this one, work towards this one, one, four, five, or two, two three, four, okay? Those are the solid combinations, that's my strategy. Now, you'll notice here that to, to, if you look at all the winners, by the way, none of the winning combinations start with three, <laughs> okay? So you can do all the dogfighting all you want, but you still have to be in either, you have to have one of your team players in either first or second to be in a winning combination. So I guess what I'm saying is I temper the team racing, you still have to do some fleet racing and then have to know when it's time to go fast and you know win the race or get into second place, okay? Because none of the winning combinations start with three. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Again, stop me if I'm going too quick or you want some more information on something or you want to talk about San Francisco. You know, I'm happy to, to do any of that stuff. All right. We had San Francisco win tonight, I think, but uh, hopefully it'll stay with you for the next week. Um, okay. So those are the solid combos. Now. Uh, why are they solid? Why are they strong? What you'll see is two boats together, two teammates together, okay? One, two, okay? Four, five. Or in this case, all three. Now that is powerful because <clears throat> let's say we're going to a uh, finish line. Okay. And let's say green is, is uh, doing good here, okay? Let's say green, the wind is coming down like this, okay? Is that fairly obvious to everybody? You're going up to a finish line. Um, <clears throat> all these two guys, because they're together, okay, they can do something called balancing, and I'll show you a little bit later, but all they got to do is keep those guys behind, okay? Or if it's something like this, okay, um, then what they can do is they can do a pass back and drop them back. But the, the fact that they're together means that they can control the sides, okay? Now let's say it's something like this where um, let's say now blue, blue has a one, four, five, okay? 
And again, these blue guys are controlling the green guys. And all they have to do is keep those guys behind. This guy is confused. Does he try to beat this guy? This guy keeps, all he has to do is keep him behind. If he goes down here, well, now what does he do? Does he go there? And then these guys get ahead, and then something, they got one, two. So he's kind of in a dilemma. So I jumped ahead a little bit there, but that's the strength of having teammates together in a team race, is they can help each other out. And that's why it's a team race. They're not focused on winning the race themselves. They're focused on getting into one of these solid combos and then executing the moves, okay? Now, the moves. That's the tactics, okay? <clears throat> I listed here, there's a couple of different kinds of tactics to execute the moves to get into these solid combos, okay? The first is a pass back, okay? And I think I'm going to show you some demonstrations of this stuff now. See if I can get it up here. Let's see. Okay, let's, let's talk about the pass back, okay? This is a luffing pass back, okay? So essentially the two yellow boats, let's look at them as uh, in the combinations, let's say they're in a 1-3 or perhaps they're in a 4-6. Uh, now, in the strategy there in the combos, is a 1-3 or a 4-6 part of any of those? No. But what is? A 1-2 or a 4-5, okay? So what they're going to try to do is they're going to do this luffing pass back where the winner boat is going to sacrifice their own speed by luffing their jib and sometimes over trimming the main and really messing up the wind for the boat just to lure it of them. That causes them to go slow. No problem, because the boat immediately to lure of them goes slow also. But the guy who's just below him, okay, he goes fast and essentially gets ahead. That is a luffing pass back. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's one way of dragging the guy ahead. Now, we said, or I said earlier, that team racing is a chess game, okay? So for every move there is probably going to be a counter move, right? So if you're blue, any ideas on what blue would do there? Slow down and back. Now, if you tack away, you give it up potentially, okay? You're going, but when you slow down, slow yourself down or slow somebody else down, okay? Really, but you, what you want to do is you want to do to the opponent what the other opponent is trying to do to you. And that's one of the fundamental rules in team racing. So if that blue guy can also left his jib and slow down that lured blue bo yellow boat, then essentially this one blue boat is slowing down two yellow boats. That means that there's two blue boats somewhere else probably going fast and either getting further ahead or catching up. Okay? So that's the beauty of the pass back. So the faster yellow can make it happen, they're happy about that. And the, the longer blue can slow it down from happening, that's his strategy. So again, chess game. Think about that on all of these. For everything I'm talking about, you should be thinking about what's the other color trying to do. OK? That is a luffing pass back. Now, let's say it's a scenario where, um, Let's say it's a scenario like this, okay. Um, you're trying to do a two, three, four. Yes. And um, you may not want to uh, sacrifice, let's say you're green three, you may not want to sacrifice your position and slow yourself down, okay, because there's, let's say it's like this, okay. You don't want to, if you get involved in the slowing down of this guy and everybody slows down, then you let this guy get ahead, okay. And that's good for blue because now they're in a one two. Okay, so in some instances, green's in what combination right now? Two, four, six probably. Okay, and they they don't want that. They want two three four. So the first step is to probably do what's called a speed pass back. Now if you're think of yourself if you're blue three there. Okay, and you're off the off the starting line and you're going upwind. 
Is that, are you a happy camper here? Or are you getting bad air from this guy? Okay, you're probably getting bad air, and so naturally you kind of fall back. That's how it typically happens on the starting line. So if you can do a speed pass back where your lured guy's got decent position on him, and just sailing fast, but have him pinning this guy and have him in your bad air, naturally he's going to fall back. That's called a speed pass back. It's a different way of doing it. If you don't want to sacrifice your position on this uh, final beat, that's something you can do to do that. Okay, another type of um, pass back is the arc trap. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't get what number three is doing. Is yeah, good, good the call. Number, the, I didn't get what the green boat was supposed to do there. The green boat, okay. What we show on this animation is the yellow boat is not doing anything. They're sailing fast. But the position, because the blue boat is in the lee, getting bad air from the windward yellow, okay, then naturally that guy falls back, okay? Think of the, the two windward boats going off of a starting line. Would you want to be blue? No. Right. So what happens? You fall back, and that's what's happening here. So there's a natural pass back happening without uh, the most windward boat taking an aggressive action. So that's a slower transpiring pass back? Yeah, yeah. But you don't have to slow yourself down. Because remember, if you're luffing your jib and over trimming your mane, you're going real slow, so you're definitely not moving towards the finish line quickly. OK? OK, thank you for the question. Uh, next one's a mark trap. This is like setting a pick in basketball, OK? You get up there, and you stop. And this guy, what can Blue do? Can he go below you and go inside you at the now uh, it's, it's still two bo boat length zone and team racing. We haven't shifted that over to three boat lengths, I don't think, yet. But he can't go inside you in the zone because that's not within the rules, right? Does everybody agree with me on that? Okay. So what he has to do is he has to go over the top of you. And as he does that, okay, then you luff him up, take him out, and then your buddy gets in there, and you go from a 4-6 into a 4-5 or perhaps a 1-3 into a 1-2, okay? So mark traps happen all the time. Now, Jess, what is Blue gonna try to do? Well, you can't. We said we, you can't because the rules say that's not allowed, okay? Let's, let's do that one here. Okay, let's say they're coming down to the, the reach, reach mark here. Right on the okay, this guy, one, one is waiting on the circle, okay? And these guys are coming around. They're, they're trying to go around the mark that way. Okay. Now, blue four, he can't, he can't go in here, right, because he's inside the zone. That's not an option, okay, because then he would break the rules. And we don't, team racing is not about breaking the rules. It's about using the rules in uh, strategic or tactical scenarios, okay. So the only other option he has, right, if, he's, if he can't go that way, then he goes this way and he tries to go over the top with speed. Well, what does green one do? He meets the challenge and pins him, okay? And then this guy rounds, okay? Now, chess, chess game, right? What, um, what can blue do? And, and what, what addition to slow down? Take out three. Take out this guy, exactly, okay. So what you'll see is on these reaches, whether they're going that way or that way, okay, <clears throat> this guy will slow down a little bit, slow down, and get himself overlapped, okay? And so now he's in a position to do that. Okay, because guess what? He's probably got a blue teammate coming behind. Okay, and then if he pins him, then he can do that, right? So it comes down to an, who's going to take the initiative and do it first. So really good team racers, like you probably saw in Florida, will try to, they won't wait for the mark necessarily, they'll execute a little earlier. This guy will slow down and try to pick, pick this guy early, okay, so that this guy can do it, okay? <clears throat> So, again, who's going to act first to get into, again, 1-3 or 4-6, whatever it is, um, they're trying to make that pass back happen. And uh, it might be a, uh, a mark trap, it might be a pin move, okay? But that's what we're trying to do. And um, that's the fun of team racing is you go, am I going to wait for this or am I going to do it earlier? Is, and then what's this guy going to do? Now, here's another scenario. Um, Let's say, <clears throat> let's say now uh, there's two, two guys coming, okay? 
and this guy's waiting at the, uh, let's say he waits at the uh, mark here, okay? He's going to try to do a trap on two boats. Is that going to work? Anybody got any insight? Can he trap these two boats? They can't go down here, right? We said that, that they're not allowed to go inside. Can he trap them? Can he luff up? Can, when these guys go high, can he take them both up? The answer is yes, it happens, okay? But the more seasoned veteran team racers, they anticipate that and they don't let that happen, okay? They don't, the blue boats don't hook each other. They don't overlap each other. And instead, what they'll do is they'll do what's called a high-low maneuver, okay? And that's where the four, first boat <clears throat> luffs, he goes high, okay? And then this guy responds, right? Takes him out. And then worst case scenario, okay, if he takes him out, yeah, he's pinning that guy, but then this guy gets through, okay? Well, he can, he can. So the worst, I, I should take that back, the worst case scenario for blue is that they forced one to round the race. Because remember I said earlier, if one boat can slow down two opponents, that's probably a good thing, okay? So whether this guy's in, in uh, first, okay, or any of the other positions, if, if the guy's waiting up here and luffing these guys and they're all pinned, that means that this green guy is either going to catch up his teammate or he's going to get further ahead, okay, which is bad for blue, okay? So <clears throat> what blue does is they do a high-low, they go high, and if the guy doesn't come down in time, this guy can get in there. Worst case scenario, he jobs back down, closes the door, okay, and then they've forced green to round. Does that make sense? Yes. It makes sense, but Gavin, that's assuming that he's here. <laughs> what about how these scenarios work in wider? I think it's really iron. Yeah, it's a good question. Or anybody ever been to uh, Charleston and sailed in Charleston? Where's a river that has a lot of current? What's that? Close by. Where's the river that? Is the down after uh, that storm came through uh, last year and they opened the floodgates? If you're setting a mark trap in the middle of the river by downtown and that water is ripping through, might be a problem, right? Let's say the current's ripping down like this, okay, with the wind. And you set up your mark trap and you're going, all right, cool, I'm going uh, to do a mark trap here and help my buddy out, okay? But guess what? There's a little bit of a gap, okay? And so as you're waiting, and these guys are hauling butt down there, you're going sideways because there's current, okay? And then, guess what? You see them coming, and then you can't even make the mark now because you're drifting down so much. So that's another element to team racing that, just like in fleet racing, you have to understand when you stop your boat, getting it going, okay, it's going to take a little bit of mo to get going, and you're going to go sideways. And if there's current, you're going to go sideways even more. Or if it's light air, okay, as you suggested in the first part of your question, it doesn't just go move forward, it goes first and then. So where would I recommend setting up for this? Well, it depends. If there's a lot of current, you know, maybe don't wait. <laughs> Do it earlier, okay? If there's not a lot of current but it's light air, maybe you're setting up in this quadrant up here, this part of the, uh, the, the zone, okay? That way you got a little bit of forgiveness to go sideways to accelerate and get around the mark. Any other questions on this? Yes, sir. So with them doing all that, you say a lot of them do that going circles, then you give them away your inside uh, rights, correct? That's right. That's right. When you tack or jibe, you, 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 you reestablish the overlap instantaneously. And now, basically, um, so yeah, you don't want to, if, if you go way out here to Tim 2 and then you jibe back in, and now you're on port <laughs> coming in, and this guy's on starboard, yeah, that's a problem. So there's a lot of moving pieces here, okay? That's why this is such a fun game, you know? And, it's, and you gotta think, and it, it doesn't come, I mean, we can do this on the chalkboard all day, but then you gotta try it on the water, and you gotta try it in light, you gotta try it in current. And um, so, I mean, the nice thing about my experience, I went to college uh, at the Naval Academy, and we did this a lot, and we got to practice. Okay, but the average, well, I'd say half of you guys are young and half of you are not, but um, the ones who are younger may have more time to practice, okay, and the ones who are older may not. But that's all right, it just means, you know, when you do practice or you do sail, you got to maximize that learning. So maybe you talk about the tactics and strategy before you go out 
then you go out and race or execute a few drills, and then you make sure you rehash it when you come back in so you can maximize the, the training. But um, if some of the stuff is kind of making your head turn a little bit, you're not alone. I mean, it's, uh, there's a science. I, I wrote a freaking book on it here, you know? So um, you could read this. You could play with magnets. Uh, you can do a lot of things. And that way, when you get out in the water, hopefully it's going to you know, come together. Now, in team racing, we've been talking about this strategy and, and what we're going to do. Um, what we did at, at Navy is we'd call out, you know, play one, play one, or play two, or, or play four, okay? One was uh, one, two X, you know, play four was one, four, five, you know. Did it fool the other teams? Maybe initially, but a lot of the real competitive teams, they all kind of figured it out. But what it does is it forces you to communicate because your level of understanding might be different from your teammate, okay? And really, all you're trying to do is act as a team out there to execute this chess game and get across the finish line in a winning strategy. So I can't encourage you enough to communicate. Tell the other guys on your team, hey, we're going for the one-two. You know, pin that guy. Or hold on. Or sail fast. We're going for the one-two. You know, remind your teammates as to what you're working towards. Joey. We would do, when I was at Navy, and this was uh, the late 80s, early 90s, okay, we spent a lot of time breaking down the race course um, into the component legs of that end course. Or not the end course. Back then we were doing the uh, Port Triangle. And you know what? We spent a lot of time on the final beat because no matter what you did on all this other stuff, it really came down to making sure that you were in the solid combo going uh, up the final beat and crossing that finish line. So, the answer to your question is, um, yeah, we would actually, after we do the drill, and coach would realize we did something wrong or did something right, he'd yell at us. And sometimes we'd talk for a minute, sometimes we'd talk for a few minutes, okay? And then we'd do it again. But I'm not saying that you're, you're going to be able to have that opportunity here. Um, you know, we were forced to go to practice every day. We were enjoying your taxpayer dollars to, you know, get schooled up on team racing. And uh, <laughs> so now I give back, and here I am. But... Um, <laughs> Anyways, uh, yeah, I mean, what's the best way to train? Sure, there's a lot of different philosophies, but, you know, as long as everybody buys into it, um, that's the best thing I think you could do, as long as everybody buys into what is going to happen out there. Um, there's, uh, I want to see if I got, I want to show you another thing called balance here. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, um, it, it, typically it's going to be the, uh, the boat that's the furthest upwind because they can see best of what's transpiring with the team. So it may not be the team captain, but every, so really everybody needs to know the game. Skippers, crews, and so that way when you're in that position to make the call, hey, it's going to be a play one, two X, you can make that, you know. Uh, with novice teams, when you go to the highest level, you'll see the, the team captain calling out the play from below everybody else, and he or she may not be able to see it as well as the guy or gal who's most upwind. So it's, that's why it's not, you know, um, uh, one maestro up there leading the whole thing. Everybody's kind of buying into it and communicating it. Um, I wanted to talk about balance, because this is a uh, fundamental concept in team racing that doesn't exist in fleet racing and not even in <clears throat> match racing, okay? Um, balance is, let's say those guys are in yellows, if they start off at the bottom of the screen, they're in a 1-3 combination. Is 1-3 up there under strategy? No. Is 1-2? Yes. So how are they going to do it? They balance, okay? If you were to put a <clears throat> ladder on the final beat and those black lines are equally distant, ladder rungs, equal distant upwind, okay, to the finish line. Um, when that starts off, you can see that the two pairs, right and left, are unbalanced, okay? So the way they balance them back is the, the, the pair on the right luffs their jib, just like they would do in a luffing pass back. They slow themselves down, and they slow the lured boat down, and they relatively 
<coughs> equalize the two pairs so that then when they cross the finish line, they're in the one, two, okay? Does that make sense? Okay, good. Everybody's climbed a ladder and <laughs> your le legs are unbalanced and you can stand on one rung and be balanced. But the, uh, now, we talked about chess, right? Um, what, what's, uh, what's the goal of blue here then? They don't want balance, do they? If yellow wants balance to get into one, two, blue does not. So blue is hoping that <clears throat> if there's unbalance, what they'll do is they'll be able to come across, okay? Let me use this thing again here, okay? If they're going into a finish line and <clears throat> and it's unbalanced, okay, then <clears throat> blue would be real happy if, if this thing happened, basically, okay? And then they would tack there. This guy crosses the finish line first, and what can these blue boats do right here? A luffing pass back, okay? Spit that guy out, okay? He bails, this guy goes with him, and then he balances him back so that his teammate gets in, something like that. And now they're in the two, three, four, powerful, I call this the powerful triangle, okay? <clears throat> and the reason why is because <clears throat> they control these guys no matter where they go. It's three controlling two boats, okay? So, um, and if this guy gets in trouble, Okay, because that guy gets bow out him, he can call for some help, and he can call over here, and this guy can come over. This guy tacks back, okay, and then again the blue team balances back, and then they can create that powerful triangle again, okay. Really easy to do on a chalkboard, by the way, okay. <laughs> <clears throat> but that's where it starts, and that's how this happens on the water. Um, and it, it, it's not like they just go out there and they figured it out. They were trained, they saw it on a chalkboard, they played with salt and peppers at McDonald's on, you know, on the road trips trying to figure out, you know, let's go through these scenarios again and uh, put it all to work. But that's the, uh, the, the strength of the 2-3-4, okay? Right there is that they can work together. The other strength is <clears throat> if you're this guy and you don't cross the finish line, what do you do? If you choose to get on this guy, and send him back, then they still got a one-two, right? If you choose to get on this guy and give up your first, they still got a one-two, okay? So you're kind of in a dilemma. And so that's why what you'll see in, in <clears throat> good team racers is this guy, does, he stays in touch. The novice team racer will go, I'm going to win the race because Gavin said most of the winners start with one, and that's going to be me. Well, that, there was a caveat to that where you got to help your teammates out, okay? And so you got to stay in touch. So they don't let this happen. They don't let that powerful triangle form. And what they do is they cause this guy to stay low or something, but they don't give up their first place. Or, you know, when it gets desperate, when they have formed it, you got to pick something. Um, but it's taking the initiative and doing it earlier to uh, keep that from happening. But that's why the, the two, three, four is one of the strongest combinations out there, okay? The, um, <clears throat> the one, the one, two, by the way, let's talk about why that's strong, okay? Um, let's say they're going up the final beat, and it's something like this, okay? And then the wind shifts, okay? So it's something like this. And now they're coming back, and they're looking really good, okay? And uh, this guy, green two, is now in a position to potentially get on top of this guy, make a pass back, and bring green into a 2-3-4. But the benefit of the 1-2 is, as they work that final beat, they, they go both sides. And so if there is a shift, because it's team racing and they're working together, they can balance it back, OK? If the wind shifts the other way, and it's like this, OK? Now the wind's coming from here. What can blue 4 do? Balance? Yeah, balance, again, okay? So these are fundamental concepts. I spend a lot of time on them because it's, it's really important, okay? And the strength of the 1-2 uh, the, um, and the 2-3-4, I've just kind of talked briefly about those on the, uh, on the final beat. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. When you're, when you're ahead, say, when you're like first place, and you see a boat that you need to get on, will, will you aggressively reach off and go get them? Or, or yeah. So, so sometimes boats peel off and maybe reach down. Absolutely. Because if, if you can distract the guy from doing what he wants to, if he's, if he's just looking down at the guy below him and he's figuring out how I'm going to get the opponent, but if now if you're on top of him or her and making him feel some heat and limiting him from tacking away, okay, then he's not going to be able to execute as well. So, yeah, really, I mean, the best team races go really slow sometimes because everybody's doing the right things, and it's a, a you know, back-and-forth type scenario. And when you're on this end course and you got three, three races going on and the first one is a, a well-matched team, that might slow the whole thing down, you know? So you got to give your space between the races that you start so that you don't really cluster them up. When you spend 50 years trying to get in first place, really <coughs> to reach off and go do the You know, you're thing. not the first person who said that. Most people who transition to team racing, when they first start, that is the tough, most difficult thing, is to get them not to think about finish line but instead think about what combo are we working towards, you know? But that's why there's a team and the guy who has a hammer and says, hey, we're going for, don't go for this, you know, we're gonna go for this, two, three, four, give it up, okay? Um, all right, so some pretty cool stuff there. Um, I talked very briefly, I wanna share again the, strat the uh, strength of the one, four, five on the final beat, okay? Let's say you're blue. Um, <clears throat> one, four, five. Okay. Two. Okay, the strength of the one, four, five is this guy, he, he definitely needs to win the race, okay, but he doesn't want to give it away. He doesn't want to get way up there. He wants to stay in touch, okay? Um, and this guy, all he has to do is, is keep that boat behind. In fact, th those two guys, all they need to do is keep that one boat behind, okay? In fact, what you see sometimes is um, a pair of boats double teaming, okay? Um, where they stay close. Where this one might, a double team move is where this guy um, basically goes slow, okay? And this guy is also going slow, but he's also pinning this guy from tacking. That's not necessarily something you would do on a one four five, but you would if it was something like this, where, let's see, you were trying to bring a, a teammate up, okay? Let's say it's, um, you, we're, you're trying to um, do a maneuver like that, okay? Here, you're trying to get to the two, three, four for blue, and so you double team this guy, and effectively you, you go like that relatively, and then this guy goes out front, and then now you're back to the powerful triangle again, okay? Again, very easy with magnets. <clears throat> okay, so the strength of the 145, we talked about, and I want to just remind you of it, just so I cover all the bases here, is um, these guys are, all, all green has to do is two boats keep one boat behind, and this guy who's in first wins the race. Now, chess game. Of the three strong combos, the 145 is the weakest. Anybody know why? That's right. That's right. If these guys are smart, blue, if they've, you know, played with magnets themselves, what are they going to do? Yeah. Okay? S balance, send them back. This guy, boom, two, three, four. Okay? So that's why the one, four, five is the weakest of those three combinations. But against certainly a novice team and maybe the average team, it's, it's, it's still a strong combo because there's some strength. The guy who's ahead, it's easy for him to win the race and it's easy for the two guys to keep that one boat behind. There are a couple of moves. Uh, question. Anybody want to ask a question how to make the 145 stronger? Do you care? That sounds like a great question. Yeah, good, okay. All right, so um, we said, let's see, 145 stronger, okay. What happens is <clears throat> this, um, if we do it on the final beat, this guy who's on the blue, he can luff him and slow him down and send him back. And so relatively, it's something like this, okay? And so now, what these guys, if these guys are going to execute their, their two, three, four, 
This guy will get on this guy, and where's this guy going to go? Down here. And now what is green looking at? Instead of the 145, now it looks like they're in a 1-3. And what, we don't see 1-3 on there, but what do we see? 1-2. One, one, I see 1-2. I like 1-2. So this guy now drops here, and they got a 1-2. Okay? That happens a lot. Okay? But um, a, a one, well, they're one, three, five. You're right, they would win it, but this guy's trying to do his job, and so now it's not going to be a one, three, five anymore, right? I'm assuming that equal boat handling and they're going to be able to execute the moves. But does a one, three, six win it? Um, one, one, three, six, you're right. Right, okay. But this guy, this guy is is um, going to, he's not going to let that happen, right? Because he's going to pin this guy back. Okay, I'm backing it up just so I can explain it to you better, okay? That's what happens because they broke off, okay? And then um, this guy is going to slow him down. These two blue guys are going to send that guy out, okay? And then what's going to happen is this guy's going to keep slowing him down like that. So it's not going to win with a 1-3-6. It's going to be a one Four six or a one five six eventually if this guy does his job right. Is that? So if I'm following you, there are some other winning scores, but as far as a active strategy, yeah. the three you have on there, the more you can actually do to control the situation if you shoot for those combos. That's right. I could tell you I could I could bring up the spreadsheet and show you that there's ten winning combinations and ten losers. But instead of that, I, there's a common theme of passbacks and mark traps and balance to get into these solid combinations where you'll stay solid longer. Yes? So really okay. you're saying if the 136 doesn't even make the list, it's really weak. It's weak. It is weak, absolutely. Yeah, you got three but it does happen, right? I mean, it, it happens. It does happen because, of think of, well, think about this beat, okay? By the way, the typical team race for a, uh, a Vanguard 15 is uh, anywhere, if you're racing on the Charles River in Boston, anywhere from seven minutes to the uh, Hinman Championship is probably 10 to 12 minutes long, the whole race, okay? Keel boats, maybe 15 to 17 minutes or something. Still short, okay? So the final beat is only three to five minutes long, but that's a long time, and, and this may happen several times, okay? So it might be that, you know, as you're trying to execute the one, four, five, or the one, you know, three in, into a one, two, that when you actually cross the line, it's a one, three, six, and it's a winner. But the goal, and again, there has to be a strategy that, that way everybody's working towards this, is to get into the winning combination. Because if you just say, okay, I'll stop, we're good, we got the one, three, six, it's a winner, then the other guys capitalize and you're losing, okay? So you've got to be constantly thinking, what are we working towards? And I'm trying to simplify. Instead of having you know, 10 strategies, I'm saying here's three that I recommend you use. There's a question in the back. Mark? Um, is the triangle the best formation? Kind of, yeah, because you're protecting. You're, you're potentially protecting both sides, OK? And you have the option to balance either way. And then the guy in the middle, he's in touch so that he can help out on either side, OK? Because if he goes over here, and there's a huge wind shift, and next thing you know, um, these guys come back and looking like this, okay, because the wind shifted like this, that's a problem, okay? So this guy has to stay in, in the middle, kind of. And that, it's a problem because. Are you going to talk a little bit about how you start and how, what you do in the first part of the first part? Yeah, I, I want to do that now because. We could, we could live here on uh, infinite, uh, inf actually not an infinite number of scenarios. They're all similar. We just talked about all the different tactics you would use. So now let's kind of work through the race course. And I'd like to start with the start, but first I'd like to... Yeah. So at the end, you can talk about that sort of practicing. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Um, 
Let me talk about it right now because it's easy, um, and then we'll get into the start, and, and the rest will go pretty quickly. But um, my wife oversees the junior program at Eastport Yacht Club, and um, she asked me, you know, okay, we got uh, junior sailors that are going to do, they're going to do learn team racing uh, for, I think, four days, okay, maybe five, two, two to three hours each day. Well, the last day is going to be kind of a mini regatta, okay, but the first four are breaking it up. In fact, the first day is doing one-on-one -on -one because really it's learning to control your own boat to start and stop, to accelerate, to understand that motion, how long it takes, okay? To understand your crew, to be able to communicate with your crew, one-on-one, -on -one, okay? And that's probably, it's certainly on the starting line is a great way to practice that, okay? And you could have r running three-minute starts where, you know, if there's four boats, this time it's, you know, Johnny versus Mary, the next one is Bobby versus Sue, okay? And maybe the next one it's, you know, Mary versus Bobby or something. And you could run through that pre repetitively and then you, you talk about what you learned out there. The, um, then you want to do it um, upwind around the top mark and then back down to the finish, okay? And run that several times. Um, maybe the next day or the next time or the next part of your, your training session, you do um, two on two. Okay, and again, it's starting together, and then it's going upwind. And on two on two, the way you typically do that is the team that has last or fourth loses. So it's a game of pinning upwind and keeping the opponent in last. And sometimes it, it, it takes a long time because you may be going away from the mark because they're doing a real good job of pinning them. Okay, so it's learning to control your own boat and the opponent below you, but also keeping in touch with the fact that there's another pair out there that you got to time it back to the mark. The mark is always the, where am I headed next, okay? So that's a two on two, and you can do that upwind balance, and you can do it downwind balance as well, okay? Um, the, um, uh, then you kind of get into three on three, and perhaps you want to do just uh, the final beat, or you know, the upwind leg or something, upwind to, to the leeward mark and start, instead of doing the whole race, because as I said when we started this thing tonight, there's a lot going on, and there's a lot to be learned, and there's a lot to be forgotten. So if you can kind of minimize that process, you can still have a lot of fun running drills, and that, that's, um, that's kind of a learned experience. You wouldn't think, practice, uh, that sucks, but practice team racing is, running drills is a lot of fun, because it's basically just bite-sized pieces of the race. Yes, sir? That's what I'm suggesting. Two on two or three on three. Right. Yeah. Upwind, come back. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. That, that's it. Okay. Um, yes. Okay. Well, if you're that piggy in the middle, if you will, okay, um, you got to get out of there. So you either got to. Do what the guy to windward is doing to you. To, you want to do that to the leeward guy. But, so you're either accomplishing that and staying in the middle, which is a good thing, or you're being spit out. And if you're getting spit out, then you tack away. What, what if it's two on two, like a speed yeah. pass? Like, uh, like it would be easier to tack away than you can? Or yeah. Off? You could tack, and then that, that guy's job is to go with you and cover you. It's like a mini mat, match race, if you will. And how good are you at tacking, and how good are you at getting bows out and getting through them? Um, so yeah, that's kind of some of the. Are those some good tips for practicing? Yeah. Um, let's talk about uh, the start. I think this is. Uh, I want to show you one more thing because um, the downwind scenario is uh, somewhat confusing on how to control boats. So let's talk about understanding the overlap. Okay. This is kind of what typically happens. Um, what you don't see is the end of the deal there where that yellow boat is able to take out the blue. The yellow boat gets ahead. So um, what's transpiring here is blue started off and they came from behind, okay? And because they came from behind, they don't, um, the yellow boat is in control of them. And that yellow boat can luff, the lead yellow boat can luff them. And so what blue does is they break the overlap by heading up. And they go, overlap broken, I'm looking at my transom, and the overlap is broken. Now, 
when the lead blue boat comes back down to the leeward, the, to the course, yellow is confined to sail, to, to round that mark, to sail the proper course around the mark, okay? And so, does that make sense, the first part of that? That's what... Because he said no overlap outside of the two bar. Yep. Circle, so. I'm just talking about the first half. We, we're not at the mark yet. So the no overlap, that's what's called in, in, in my book an up-down, okay? It's an up-down maneuver. And you see these guys, they shoot up, they broke the overlap, and they yell it, and they do an arm motion so that the umpire sees it behind, and well, then they come back down. That means the guy just can't take them up. That means yellow cannot take them up, okay? Yellow doesn't like that. Yellow wants to get ahead of them, or they want their opponent to get them. Because now the yellow is coming from behind. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So now, as the overlap is reestablished, when this boat comes back down, it's essentially like this boat is coming from behind. That's the relative motion, okay? So blue came from behind. Blue, blue came from behind like that. Then yellow came from behind because of the up-down. That's right. Okay. And now yellow says, I got one last you know, rabbit in the uh, hat here. I'm going to do what's called a jibe-jibe maneuver. And when they jibe twice, <clears throat> they jibe on the port and then they jibe back on the starboard. But now, because they've jibed, they instantaneously establish that overlap, which means they have lured boat luffing rights. And so now they can take blue out. So this is something that, you know, it's uh, litigious, if you will. And so <clears throat> as this becomes an issue when you're out there racing or practicing, you're going to need to talk about this. Anytime. In a Vanguard 15, um, if, it's, if it's not too windy, you just pull in across, pull in across. I mean, you see these guys. It's, it's not like a really well-planned. It's, it's literally grabbing the main sheet, boom, boom. Keel boat's a little bit more difficult. Um, but yeah, it's, it can be very, it's quick. And so is the up-down. The up-down's tiller over, head up. Um, so... Yeah, at the at the bottom he waits till he gets. Uh, oh, till he gets to the circle. Yep, exactly. And then blue doesn't have any time to do an up down again. Yeah. And this, if the longer further back they go, this could happen a few times. The jibe jibe, the up down, the jibe jibe up down. You know. Well, hopefully they they understand. <laughs> that's that's an assumption. We'll we'll use that assumption. Okay, so. Um, I wanted to, let's talk a little bit about starts, um, and let's go to, let's see, uh, okay, the way I liken the start practice is um, three sets of match races, and this is where, again, the one-on-one -on -one practice is really good. If you're being tailed on starboard tack, um, there's only one one option, okay? And that is to do, to, to break away like that, okay? Let's say um, this is your, your ley line, okay, on, for the two marks, okay? What happens is, <clears throat> let's say blue is tailing green, okay? And for novice green, what the guy does is he goes, he tries to tack, and Blue says, don't tack, I'm on starboard. And then he goes, oh, darn. And then he goes, he tries to jibe. And he says, don't jibe, I'm on starboard. And guess what? They get further and further away from the starting line, okay? So um, when you find you're being tailed and you're down here in this zone, it's a bad thing, okay? Because it's, it's very difficult to get out. In fact, the only way I'd say you can get out without help of a teammate, and we'll talk about that in a second, is <clears throat> you figure out where you're at, okay? And what happens if, if the guy is back here, okay, and he says, don't tack, you say, okay. And then what happens is you kind of luff up a little bit, you bear off, trim, luff, trim. If you were doing this on the starting line, what would eventually happen? Blue would trail back, right? In a fleet race? If you're off the line, you're going to pinch him off? That's essentially what you're doing, is you're pinching him off. But it might be that you have to kind of stop, luff, accelerate, do it again. And so basically it gets to the point where he gets closer and closer to you and falls back and now you're at a position where you can tack <clears throat> and he can't do anything. He can't get to you, okay? 
So that's how you get out of being tailed on starboard. The faster you learn that, okay, and the faster you realize that this is a no-go zone when you're being tailed, is going to make you a much happier match racer or team racer, okay? <clears throat> so if you can do that up here and you realize it, you got some time and you're not in the no-go zone and you can get back, okay? So that's it. That's how you get out of being tailed on that. The only other way is if you got a buddy, if you realize you're over here and you got, let's say, a, a, another minute, you can say, hey, uh, two, I need some help. Two comes along, they left them up right there, and then you peel away and jibe, okay? And that's what I call the pin release. Blue was pinning you, your buddy came in, pinned them, and released you, and now you're free to go, okay? So two is in the situation. Potentially, potentially. So maybe, you know, more reason not to go down here, but hopefully they're going to they're gonna be able to get out there or something. But this guy might get frazzled or something. And you're right, but at least uh, you know he. Hopefully he's going to put himself in a position where he's going to be a little further bow out, and he'll do the same thing. But you're right. So, so is the risk of being tailed that you get pushed into that no sail zone? I mean, it, it'd be great to start with a guy tailing like that. That's right. That's right. And so the question is now you got you know three boats. So you're let's say this is a guy. Your job is to beat that guy. Okay. <clears throat> There's, um, the question is, you know, when are you going to start, okay? If you can force green into that no-go zone, then at least when you come back to the line, whether it's on time or late, at least you're ahead of that guy. That's the goal. <clears throat> Again, a, a novice move might be to go way down here and start the race well behind the other guys, because what if the, the other two opponents got a great start and they're way ahead now, okay? And you just kind of put yourself further back so you can't help out your teammates too much. So the goal should always be start on time, but start ahead of the guy or the boat that you're covering, okay? So that's being tailed on starboard. And that's what this animation, I think, tries to do. Let's tr look at port now, okay? Ports, you got that option as well. You could left them up and get out of there, okay, and tack. But the other option is, if you're going down, <clears throat> if you can try to break low and the guy says, don't jibe, don't jibe, don't jibe, but if you can get down where you're about downwind, okay, and then we said on the V15, it's really easy to do, even some of those keelboats, you just pull the boom across. You don't even change your course necessarily, and now you're on starboard. And this guy probably yells, at, hey, you can't do that, you jibe too close. You only jibe too close if blue doesn't have an out, okay? If you... If you're like this, okay, going down, and you don't alter your course, or you alter it very little, and you pull it over, as long as this guy has an out to either luff up or to jibe, then you haven't fouled him. Does that make sense? Yeah, question. Okay, so each boat's different, each condition's different. What, uh, so like a V15 in ideal conditions in a team race with collegiate racers, how much time, generally time is kind of what it seems like it comes down to Well, it's, it's, it's recognition. The sooner that green realizes they're in trouble, okay, they got to act on it. And it might mean how quickly they're going to be able to get back to the line. Right. But what I'm saying is when green flipped the jump into starboard, yep. he all of a sudden put it, he gained an advantage through an action, so he has to get blue room so yep. he's not too close. That's right. So how do you keep it? You mean to communicate that to an umpire who's behind? Yeah. yeah. If, if, there, if there is one. <laughs> if there is one. Yeah. When we do it to each other. Right. Because we don't get three inches of each other. Too yeah. Close. That's right. That's right. What and so. What's a reasonable well, is it too close if they have time? No, it's not. If they have time and opportunity to get out of it, it's, then it's not too close. Right. So we're, we're, as a fleet, we're getting to the point where, you know, we're about 18 months old. People are starting to move very close to the same speed. We're getting a lot of interactions, getting tighter and tighter and tighter. Mm -hmm. So in fleet racing, this is coming up. So I know it's going to come up a lot more in team racing. And right. we're hoping that, that this will be part of what strengthens our rules. Yep. The question is, how much, when have you found somebody? When is too close to be close? Yeah, and, and, and the, the answer is not one or two Mississippis. Okay. The right. answer is, can they get out? And that's why you're going to have to have an ongoing discussion. You're going to have to come back and talk about it and say, what did you see? Well, I saw I had, you know, I didn't have enough time. Or, and the other person says, well, I saw you did have enough time or something. And, and so, but, I, yeah. 
Comment? No. Okay. So, I mean, it's tricky, right? It is tricky, but you know, that's what, there has to be a respect. You know, when I, I uh, teach team racing, I, I teach uh, control, not contact. The goal is not to foul, get other people to foul you, it's to control them, okay? So if you're the starboard guy, when you pull that boom across, okay, you're not trying to get the blue guy to hit you, you're just trying to say, hey, by the way, I'm on starboard now, so you need to do something. <clears throat> and then they go, uh, well, you can't do that. Well, there's still separation. You're talking, it's too, too long, right? Yeah. Like a uh, 15 year old that's hopped up on energy drinks, knows what the hell he's doing, he's right on with all of his stuff. I'm not that sharp anymore. Yeah. He's gonna, he's gonna, he's gonna catch Where, me. You got to put some of those energy drinks in the fridge there, I think, or something. Right, right, right. <coughs> I'm not that sharp. He's going to catch me, and it's going to yeah. take me an extra second, or not a second, but it's going to take me some quantifiable portion of time more than it's going to take him to get out of it. Yeah. So, how do you, how it, does it turn into this relative? Well, it's, um, if, if, if there was an umpire out there and they were looking at that scenario and you realized that you acted as soon as you could, you don't have to act. If you're blue, you don't have to do anything until that boom is filled on this side, okay? And if you acted when that happened and you did your best to try to get out or to jibe, okay, and you couldn't do it, then guess what? That was too... He fouled Yeah, he fouled you. You know, I mean, I, I, I can't. So it couldn't do it. There was time. That's right. Yeah, that's right. So it's so back to you. I mean, it sounds like the starting deal. Like, you know, someone comes up and they're like, come up, come up, yeah. come up. And, or, you know, they're here and you're like, bam. Oh, look at that. I'm sorry. Well, and, and, and that's, that's the one the umpires struggle with that too. Because was it that, you know, the lure boat came up too fast? That when the winner boat, you know, tried to respond, that they went sideways and they turned their stern into them? You know, was it the lure boat's fault or was it the windward, you know? And it's almost a coin toss on those. You know, how, how good is the umpire or the judge at seeing that? And um, I try not to get into those scenarios because I don't want it to be relying on a coin toss, you know? And we did, like, and, and I remember, like, my first college team racing when boats would be going downwind and someone throws a jive in and tags you out. That's how my coach was. I'm like, but I didn't, didn't even give me time. He's like, but you need to know that that's going to happen. And so the way that we had to coach to it was you were out because you should have thought of it ahead of time. That's you right. Shouldn't have ever let it happen. There, there is a, a common uh, strategy and respect for the rules that, you know, if the team's in a losing combination, you probably know what they're going to try to do. If they're in a 1-4-5 or 1-4-6, they're probably going to try to get into a 1-4-5. So, yeah, there, there is an element, and that's part of the game. We're not out there doing a fleet race where we're going to stay far away from each other. It's a team race, and boats come together, and it happens. Maybe that's why we have those bumpers on the boat. Well, you're, you're, <laughs> you're, you're right. And the, the Vanguard 15 is a fragile boat. I mean, it's very fast and agile, but it's also fragile. And so, yeah, on the championships, we put the bumpers, because even the guys and gals that are the best end up hitting each other, and we don't want to damage these boats because they're on loan to us. Um, yes? Yeah. So, are matchups that are already decided that you go to start? Good, good, good transition, okay? There's two kind of philosophies for the starting line, okay? There's what I call a geographic start, okay? If I'm bl the blue team, <clears throat> then, um, you know, he's going to start at the pin, I'll take the middle, and she's going to start at the boat, okay? And so, no matter what dog fighting and tailing and all that stuff that goes on, when it's time for the gun, time to go, that's where we need to be. We can shift. We can always say, hey, shift, you know, I'm going to start at the pin now. Okay, no problem. But we got to have a plan, and the plan is geographic where we're going to start, okay? Sometimes it's man on man. Um, it's a little more chaotic then because, you know, everybody gets clumped up. The reason for the geographic start is uh, you don't want to be messing up your teammate on the starting line. And so it forces at least your own team to separate a little bit. You still want to control the other boat. You could do man on man, but then when it comes time to start, get in the geographic spot you're supposed to be. But when you're doing man on man, oftentimes there's a shift needed because you're at the boat end when you're supposed to be at the pin. Okay? 
So it's a combination of both of those, potentially. Quick question. How long a line do you typically have in terms of boat lengths? For, for team racing, it's pretty small. I mean, you got six boats. It's probably six to eight boat lengths. It's small. Wow. Well, you don't need a lot. A boat, remember, a boat length is not a boat width. So when they're starting, you know, it doesn't, it, yeah, it's, gonna, it's, it's as little as six and, you know, maybe as much as eight, ten. Probably not ten. Small. Yeah, I mean, uh, what, what, what typically happens is there's a three-minute sequence, and the first minute, there's a separation. And let's say, you know, uh, the, 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 the one team's going to be on the left and one team's going to be on the right. It just forces them to separate, okay? That's how it kind of used to be. It's, it's less that way now, um, but that's one thing you ought to do. And that way, your team's over there and you're talking, okay, who's going to be at the pin? Who's going to be at the boat? Okay, watch out for Joey because he's really fast. Why don't you trail Joey and force him into the no-go zone? Okay, cool. But then make sure you're back at the starting line when it's time to go. Okay? So that might be how you separate. And then two minutes, you both come together and you dogfight. What typically happens now at the highest level, there's a kind of mutual respect for all the competitors. So they all kind of linger around here. Nobody's in the no-go zone at all, and they're kind of waiting here, and then it's the dance coming in. <laughs> to see who's going to be at the boat. That's, that's how you see it nowadays at the, at the highest level. But I don't encourage you to do that. I encourage you to kind of learn. You got to learn by making mistakes and doing that stuff. So don't, you know, migrate over to the boat. Just practice getting out there. OK, so that's uh, starting. Did I cover, is there any other questions on starting? I keep it real simple. Learn how to control either trail or being tailed, OK? And then uh, have a geographic start. And then, um, then it's all about going, let's talk about the first beat, OK? Let's say here's your starting line, OK? I would describe it as, let's say it's like this. And maybe this is probably. The top one third, and this is the bottom two thirds. Okay. Um, you get off the line and you go fast. Somebody's going to fall back and they're going to get a bad one. Okay. Um, somebody's going to do well, hopefully. Hopefully, two of your three are going to have good starts. Okay. The goal, just by the nature of the geographic start, it sets you up that theoretically the pin guy should own the left side. Okay. So if you're one, Sure that you're ahead of the guys going out that away. The guy who started at the boat, okay, he wants to own the right, and he doesn't want to let any blues get ahead of him, okay. And then the guy in the middle, hopefully he got a good start too. So you want to ideally you want to own the right and own the left, okay, because you don't know you might get a shift, and then you're gonna have to do some balancing. But you're kind of going fast for this first two thirds of the the first beat. You're going fast. When you get up to the top one third. Now it's time to start thinking about, OK, what combination am I in? <clears throat> OK, if I'm in a 1-3, am I going to do a mark trap here to try to make this happen? OK, move into a 1-2 or a 4-6 into a 4-5, something like that. And that's when you're char starting to maybe bal balance a couple of pairs or set up for a mark trap, something like that, or pin a guy beyond, OK? And then you're off to the uh, next mark, whether it's a port rounding triangle or you know, going off to, to these um, on the reach and potentially doing a high low or a mark trap on the reach. Okay, um, downwind. Again, we talked about that a little bit with the balance going right and left. Um, I'm not going to get too much in the detail on on that. Um, then you round the lured marks at the lured mark roundings. Again, there's an opportunity for a mark trap. Okay, because you own the zone if you get there first. Um, and then it's the final beat, and we spend a lot of time on the, on the final beat. Um, so that's kind of what I wanted to talk about tonight, and I wanted to leave some time for some questions um, on whatever you'd like to talk about, really. Yes, sir. Quick question, another course question. How far, how long does an upland lay take? Um, what, what, let's say it's a dinghy. Um, let's say the goal, I would say your goal for your Vanguard 15 fleet would be a race course of about, 
anywhere is from nine to 12 minutes. So three minute up one way? Yeah, roughly. Okay. It depends what course you're using. And again, I, I would say. So we're going to be using a square more than a digital end because we set our own courses okay. a lot. Yeah. So then you're talking about, you know, yeah, let's say if you're doing that, it's going to be yeah, probably three up, you know, two or three down, um, the and then three up. Tack for, go for a minute and a half, tack back for a minute and a half, drop the mark. Because you're setting them. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, that's a good way to do it. And then you can always move it, you know, make it a little longer, shorter. The, the fa whether it's two minutes or three minutes really doesn't matter because it's enough time to make it happen. Okay. What you don't want it to be is five or seven minutes long for the, just the beat, okay? Because what happens is then you're going really far away, and the whole goal is to keep kind of together so that stuff happens. If you, get, if you stretch yourself out on the way right and the way left, uh, it gets kind of boring. You want things to happen quickly. That's the beauty of a seven minute course on the Charles River in Boston is, man, that's exciting. I mean, your adrenaline is pumping because... What do you sail on the Charles River? Yeah. Um, they don't, they actually uh, would rather not do vanguards, but they, they do. Uh, uh, there's a regatta called the Charles River Open that um, MIT runs. And, uh, no, I, I, t I take it back. I haven't done that in a while. Because it's so confined, they have collegiate fleets of FJs, uh, Larks, I think. Um, and those are the, I don't think they even use the 420. They use FJs and, and, the, and the Larks. It's a little bit slower, yeah. Because, I mean, the Vanguard 15 on a reach, man, you're across that river in a heartbeat, you know. <laughs> you're up on the street or something. Um, questions? I, I know we've gone over a lot of stuff. Um, again, I've got... I've got more of these. Um, SailingEducation.com has the animations. Um, Joey's going to have a couple of these. You can photocopy and give them out to whoever ever wants them or needs them. Um, but uh, I, I don't have good film. I've tried for years to get good film. And the problem is you can't get, you really need a helicopter up there looking at it. And I never get that. I've gotten some where I've been up on the, you know, top of a building that, um, the start. Yeah, I don't, I didn't bring that with me, unfortunately, but it's, the challenge is, is, um, whenever you have like the perfect venue to, to capture video, it's bad wind or something, or it's a boring race where they don't interact that much. I've tried. I, I've yet to have something that, oh, this is great. You're really going to love this and you're going to learn from it. And I've tried a bunch of times. Unfortunately, that's, that's kind of why we did the animations. The animations um, were made by a buddy of mine, Brian McDonald. And he's uh, been an Apple computer guy working at Apple for, I don't know, 25 years or something. But um, he spent a lot of time creating those things. And uh, the goal was to, because we didn't have the video, you know, at least we could train people with an animation. And I, I haven't played with this in a while, but I used to be able to start and stop it. Uh, on the Mac, I think there's a couple of options I can do to stop the animation and then to start it again. So for discussion, it's kind of good. Like when we're doing that up, down, and jibe, jibe, it would have been nice to go stop what's going on there. You know. Um, so, but yeah, I don't have any good video. Sorry. <laughs> yes, Joey. On a start, how do you decide whether as a team you're going to do the slow goal or a man on man? Because any rule of thumb or is it more a preference thing? It's a preference thing. Yeah, the question was, uh, do, you do, glo do you do geographic or man-on-man? -man? And it's really a, a preference thing. The man-on-man -man might be for if you know one guy or one boat is really fast, then you might want to you know, have somebody, your guy, gang up on that guy and make sure that you're pinning that guy, that that guy starts behind. You know? But maybe the other two guys are doing the geographic. One's on the pin and one's at the boat. Man-on-man um, -man is more of an intimidation game. So if you're going against a, a more of a novice team and you want to scare them up front, you might do that, you know? Um, not break the rules, but, you know, just kind of show them we're in charge, you know, immediately. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's funny because you, you go out, after you start doing some fleet racing or something, and it's the end of the regatta, and you've got to beat this guy. Guess what? After doing a bunch of team racing, you know exactly what to do. 
And, and the guy who was beating you was all of a sudden scared because he's like, ah, what are you doing? You know, because he hasn't team raced or match raced. So it's kind of funny that way. Questions? Yes? Anything different in terms of how you communicate inside the boat between skipper and crew? Team Man, I, you know, I've been trying to sail with my wife forever, and uh, <laughs> whew, that's, a, that's not just team racing. But um, yeah, well, I, I'll tell you what. <laughs> I am the nicest guy, this is recorded here, so i got to be careful, I guess. Uh, I am the nicest guy in the world to sail with. I mean, Cruz like, oh, man, he's great. He, I learned stuff. and the, you know. But when you're with your significant other or your girlfriend forever, for some reason in sailing, I mean. Why do you I, say it like that? What do you mean by that? But it's, it's, it's true. I mean, we, we just, the relationship doesn't get abusive, but it's certainly not as cordial as it should be. But, um. <laughs> One thing, I, I, I kind of turned a corner, though. I started coaching um, in 2003. I came back, and I coached the Navy team for four years. And I really, it kind of brought me back to, hey, you know, there's some things that are important and some things aren't. And I was able to kind of throttle back my uh, competitive, aggressive nature with my spouse on the boat, you know. Now, she hasn't learned that yet. She's, when I let her steer, she's very uh, abusive to me, but... Uh, <laughs> But I, I'll have to let that one go, I guess. But um, the answer is um, communication. The best thing you can do is understand the same science. So read the book, you know, play with some salt and peppers at the uh, fast food on your road trip, you know, talk about it, um, get magnets on your fridge at home and go, hey, what about this or something? Um, because, uh, and, and then just to try to, you know, Force yourselves to always be saying, what combination are we in and what are we working towards? That's the best internal, but that also needs to be communicated to the rest of the team as well. Because once you figure out that you're in a 1-3-5 and you're going to convert that, you know, that you might want to say, okay, we're going to convert that to a 2-3-4. Well, that might not be so obvious to the other guys. They might be thinking we're going to convert that to a 1-2, you know. Um, so, again, Make sure you know what's going on in your own boat and then communicate that with your team. So in the Navy, did you sail with the same teammates all the time? So you, so you get used to each other or uh, were you always mixing it up? No. Uh, if you want to be the best, you definitely sail with, you know. We, we'd have, back in my year, and we were doing pretty good back then, um, we had probably like five top skippers. And, and probably two of them were definite on the three, three boat team. And then the third might float, depending on you know if the guy got a head head case or something or whatever. But um, no, sailing together definitely helps. And some of these guys and gals that are the best teams out there, it's partially because they sailed at high school together, and then they might have gone to college together, or they sailed to college together, and then they kept doing it afterwards. But um, yeah, I mean that can't hurt um, because you just you know exactly what they're going to do. And again, we talked about the science. You don't need to communicate because it's just, it's already there. Any of you guys want to go to the Naval Academy? I recommend it. And um, if you want to reach me uh, later uh, and talk to me about the Academy or anything else, team racing, or, you know, we can get into some more com complicated stuff. My email address is gavin, G A V I N, at obyc.com. And obyc stands for Ocean Beach Yacht Club, it's a fictitious. Yacht Club that I kind of, I didn't, San Francisco. well, no, it's actually San Diego. Oh. It, we, had, uh, <clears throat> we had a bar in the backyard, and then we had, um, uh, I think, a couple of lasers, uh, a couple of snipes, and one guy had like a Olsen 30 parked out front, so that was our, our deal. <laughs> but, um, all right, um, any other questions? Is there something, if you guys agree, I think? Thank you. Yeah. yeah. My pleasure.